Thank you. Um, uh, so I have this um, slides, which includes a little bit of introduction and then a lot of examples. And feel free to ask questions along the way. I'm happy to skip examples at the end in favor of having more questions. And Alan, just let me know when there are questions in case I don't hear. Sure. Yeah, let me just say something about that. I have a microphone on uh, throughout the room. I think there are some mics, but it can be pretty quiet when students ask questions. So uh, just, just uh, indicate to me if you need me to re restate things. OK. And then uh, I'll take a little time at the end for a bit of wrap up. So the, the theme of this talk is that there's a lot of variety in statistics. And I've enjoyed my career, and I enjoy the variety. I, work, I enjoy working with different people. So a little bit about me. I'm a statistician at Google right now. I was an undergraduate math major at St. Olaf College. And so before college, I was living in rural Minnesota. There were 279 people in one town I lived in. Then we moved to the big town of 2000. I had no idea what calculus was when I started college. So kind of starting behind, but yeah, you know, I'm caught up. Um, when finishing college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I considered the Peace Corps, I considered foreign service, I considered grad school in five different subjects I applied. Um, and the only place I didn't get in was Stanford Statistics, so that's what I went, where I went except a year later after studying another year in Germany. Uh, after finishing graduate school, oh, well, actually before finishing graduate school, I did some full-time work. And then after finishing, I was a college prof, then working in statistical software and research, and then Google. Besides that, I'm involved in various other things. I'm long time active in the Sierra Club environmental organization. I'm on a nonprofit where we take high school students to set up computer labs in third world countries. I've led trips to Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Ecuador. And I like to do water bottle rockets with kids. So check out my website. Uh, there's some instructions for doing the water bottle rockets. Themes of this talk is there's a lot of variety in statistics and it's useful. Useful to society and useful to you, it's easy to get a job. So one project I worked on back when I was in academia was on earthquakes, worked with a geomorphologist. Now, and we worked on the new Madrid earthquakes in Missouri, not that far from you guys. Uh, there are a lot of earthquakes right now in Oklahoma caused by fracking. I don't know if any of those, if you feel any of those, but the earthquakes in Missouri in 1811, 1812 were humongous. They were 8.1, 8.2 on the Richter scale. And they caused immense destruction. Uh, I've been down there and there, are, um, at the time, one thing that happened was that sand from underneath the ground, the, the ground sort of liquefied and the sand came to the top and some of these sand blows are now big enough that they cover hundreds of acres. So you can imagine how much shaking there was to liquefy the ground that that much sand would come up. There were bent trees. So walking around down there, you see hillsides where there were slides. And so the trees started growing sideways and then started growing up again. And so these are almost 200 year old, are 200 year old trees uh, growing like that. The damage was huge. Uh, this gives a map of where the different levels of the damage were. These earthquakes rang church bells as far away as Boston. Hmm. Now for comparison, in 1994, there was a 6.6 .6 quake in Northridge, California that left 60 people dead and 20,000 homeless. California is flaky. It's got a lot of sediment, bedrock is highly fractured. That means that the effects of an earthquake don't spread that far. And California tends to be relatively well prepared. In contrast, in this area in Missouri, um, people don't pay attention to earthquakes. There aren't that many of them. But when earthquakes happen, including these huge ones, they will affect a very large area. 
and there's a lot of sediment and the sediment liquefying uh, is a real problem. So our goal in this work was to estimate how the ground was deformed in these earthquakes. And in doing so, that may help us locate faults and it may help us determine how the ground is going to move in future quakes. Now, I live in Seattle. Seattle is not the place to live if you're worried about earthquakes because every 500 years or so, we get 9.0 earthquakes. And this is a exponential scale. Um, every increase of one corresponds to a magnitude of a shaking of a factor of 10 and an increase of two corresponds to a thousand times as much energy. So the difference between those central USA earthquakes and a 9.0 in Seattle is around 25 times as much energy. So I'm just hoping that this doesn't happen while I'm alive. <laughs> so what we did in this work was uh, we're trying to estimate where the faults are and how the ground ch um, changed, the deformed. And we're using stream gradients. And the idea is that streams have natural gradients. When, you, when the stream starts, it's got not very much water, it will tend to be steeper. And then as you collect the different streams and have a bigger stream or a river, it's got more power and it tends to then have a flatter course. And if for some reason the course of the river is steeper than it should be based on the amount of water it has, then it will tend to eat away at the banks. It will tend to become more sinuous over time. And, but this process takes time. So what we're looking for is places where the natural profile is steeper in one direction and less steep going in the other direction, which would indicate how the ground tilted during earthquakes. Now, over time, the streams will adjust the courses so that we can't see this, but it's only been 200 years, which isn't that long in geologic time. We may be able to still determine um, how the ground was tilted. So we were collecting data from topographic maps, and the big advantage of this is cheap. It's cheap. In contrast, a lot of earthquake work is done by going out and digging trenches and looking for faults where the ground slipped, and that's expensive. So we were trying to do two things at the same time. One is estimate what the natural profile is for streams and estimate how the ground was deformed. And we were using basically regression methods. And new methods are being developed in statistics all the time to deal with new kinds of data. And often the methods don't have to be that complicated. Um, are there any questions on this one before we move on? How's everybody doing? Any questions about, about this? So what is a, what is a stream gradient? Just real quick, big picture, remind us, please. Um, it, it's how steep it is. Okay. When you have a little stream kind of in the hills, it tends to be fairly steep. And then as you collect more and more water, something like the Mississippi, it's not that steep. The drop over the course of a mile is pretty small. Okay. Okay. Uh, Emma, go ahead. Were you able to better estimate fault lines based on these data, and did you? Um, we goal? estimated how the ground was deformed, and the estimates that we came up with agreed pretty well with estimates that people had developed based on trenching. So yes, it, the work was successful. Uh, we got a paper in Science, which is a prestigious journal. Wow. Uh, so this is then a method that people can use elsewhere in the world. Great. Okay, I think we're good to, to keep going, please. All right. Um, the next project I'll talk about is one at Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Now, just a little background is I um, was doing my statistics degree at Stanford, and I was feeling kind of stuck. 
And my wife found a job advertisement at PG&E and thought I might be interested. And so I applied for it and I stopped out of the statistics program to take this full-time job and did that for three years. Hmm. And eventually, uh, and got lucky in that there was a nice project there that ended up becoming the main part of my dissertation. Hmm. Uh, so one lesson for you all is, yeah, it, things don't always work as you planned. I, I was stuck. I, um, so I did something else for a while and then came back. So don't worry if not everything works out the way you think it might. So in this project, um, I was working at an internal consulting group. We had 20 people from about 10 different countries and degrees in a variety of areas. So we worked together to tackle some of the hardest problems that pg and faced. And I was working on fuel oil inventory. PG&E has a very diverse electric supply, probably more than any other place in the country. Hydroelectric power, nuclear, geothermal, coal, gas, oil. Um, now they'll also have solar, but back then there was not much solar. So oil, we did not like to burn. It was dirty and it was expensive, but we still needed to have it in case we had a dry year or in case the Pacific Northwest where I live now had a dry year, so there was not a lot of hydroelectric power available, or the nuclear power plants had outages, or it was cold. So we needed to use the oil, um, the gas that we might normally use for power to for heating. So oil is this field of last resort, and the question is how much to carry in inventory at the start of a winter we can't just see in the middle of the winter that we're running short and order more quick because the oil that we used was special low sulfur crude so it would burn cleaner and we had to order it from indonesia so it would take a while to come and in the winter there can be storms so you may not even be able to offload it so we needed to have an inventory at the start of the winter so what we did was basically generate artificial years, artificial hydro years, nuclear outages, temperature, and see what happens. Do we run out of oil? How much do we run out? How much um, electrical outages does that cause? Or do we not run out and have more in inventory that we need and that costs money? So we want to optimize. We want to balance these two costs. And the simulation I was running was rather expensive, um, pretty expensive, extensive simulation considering a variety of factors. And I was using five minutes at the time on the company mainframe, which this is back before PCs and cheap computers. So I really needed to make this run more efficiently. And so what we did is something called important sampling. The idea is that the interesting cases, the ones where we run out, are pretty rare. If we've got the right amount of inventory, we should run out about one out of every 200 years. So those cases are rare, and what we'll do is we'll oversample them. We'll bias our artificial years toward the colder, drier years of nuclear outages. Well, if you do that, you get bias estimates. And so what we'll do is we'll reweight the artificial years of results to counteract that bias. So for a particular artificial year was twice as likely to occur with the bias sampling that I did as with the true probabilities, then I would give that year a weight of one half. Mm -hmm. uh, and, let, let me make a comment real quick, please, to our students. Uh, we heard from a uh, previous speaker about surveys, the importance of surveys at Facebook, for example. Um, how do you conduct a survey? What wording do you use? How do you get a representative sample of the people you want to talk about? And uh, I mentioned at that time that one of your elective classes you could pick is 407, which is a s sampling, <clears throat> how to do this type of thing. Important sampling is a, is a topic within that. If you're taking samples and you want to make sure it's representative of the population, one thing you can do is weight certain subcategories differently from other ones, that type of thing. Okay.
Thanks. Great. Um, so I had weights. Some years got a weight of a half, others a weight of two, others a weight of 10, others a weight of a third, et cetera, et cetera. And then I computed a weighted average. This thing at the bottom, the sum of the weights times whatever thing I'm measuring, whatever variable, divided by the sum of the weights. And so I mentioned this to my boss, and he asked, uh, you divide by the sum of the weights? And my answer was sort of, well, of course, what else would you do? Well, then I went and looked at the important sampling literature, and that is, in fact, not what people would do. They would use this formula at the top. They would take 1 over n times the sum of w weights times the y values. Okay. Well, that thing at the top is unbiased, but the thing at the bottom is common sense. If you use the thing at the top, yes, it's unbiased, but you can get really odd results. You can get things like the probability of running out plus the probability of not running out adds up to 1.3. Doesn't add to 1. Or you take the average of y values, and all of the y values are 2, but your average turns out not to be 2. Okay, so that's just bogus. It doesn't make sense. The thing at the bottom makes sense. Mm -hmm. Except, in some cases, the method at the top actually works better. Uh, so I ended up looking into this a little more and coming up with other estimates that are better yet, and that ended up becoming my dissertation. Um, so one lesson here is sometimes it's best not to pay too much attention to the literature and just do what makes common sense. And then that can in turn lead to new methods. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Questions? Okay. Everybody's deep in thought, so I think we're happy. <laughs> All right. Okay, then I went into academia, and I was at small colleges, uh, liberal arts colleges, with small classes and a lot of student involvement. I uh, did summer research by myself and with students, and I did a lot of consulting for faculty in a variety of departments and their students. Um, so again, a lot of variety in the work. Um, I enjoyed that work. I've enjoyed every statistics job that I've had. And, um, but I didn't get tenure. And so I moved on. And I've, in fact, enjoyed the other jobs that I've had more since then. So this is another lesson that don't worry if something goes wrong. Just move on. Mm -hmm. What happens after that may work out better. Could you say something just briefly about what tenure is? And you were at a liberal arts college. I'm just thinking about uh, getting some familiarity with, with career options. One option would be teach at uh, a research university or at a liberal arts college. So you were at a liberal arts college, and could you comment on uh, what does that job look like? How does it differ from, say, a research university? And what is tenure? OK. Um, so the liberal arts college, a smaller college, and there's a real focus on teaching rather than doing research. Uh, in contrast, at larger institutions, research institutions, uh, what matters for being able to stick around there and for promotion is much more based on research. And in my case, I was probably better at the research than at the teaching. So uh, turns out that wasn't a great fit for me. Tenure is we want professors to be able to have free speech and be able to have sometimes tough discussions in their class without worrying that they're going to get fired for that. And um, uh, and so tenure is the system to ensure that. The idea is that you sort of have an apprenticeship um, some years at the institution where you're showing that you can actually teach well and uh, teach and do a research at the appropriate level. And then if you do well, then you get tenure. And once you have tenure, um, it's very hard to fire you. Uh, 
you can't be fired because of saying something controversial. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on. Then I moved to a statistical software company where I was in the research department, which for us meant that we uh, worked with academics to take new ideas from academia and turn them into software that a lot of people could use. And this was um, at the company that produced S Plus, which was the commercial predecessor to R. And so I did research, we developed software, I did some consulting, did some training, uh, taught some short courses in the US and Europe. I enjoyed the travel and did a variety of other things. Uh, one of the consulting projects was I had to spend six weeks in Zurich, Switzerland in spring. Oh, that was tough. <laughs> uh, that's a very expensive city, and it's nice to be there when somebody else is paying. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. My research at Insightful was a variety of projects. Um, bootstrapping, time series, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The sequential designs for clinical trials, I'll mention, because we'll come back to this later, that worked with a um, academic to develop software that I'll show you a little bit about later. Okay. Sounded like somebody had a question, one of our uh, joint members of the web conference. Yes, I'm, I'm a bit confused, actually. Like, we had a meeting uh, organized with Marcin for Morbitera, and that was the link given to us to join this call. Um, they may have given you a link that included my email address. Does the link end in Rock, or have Rocket in it? Yes. Yes, um, please ask them to give you a different link. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, fair enough. Are you guys from Orbitera by any chance, or is no, just... not at all. Not at all. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Cool. Sorry, sorry to disturb. Like we <laughs> just confused. See you later. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. All right. Some of the consulting I did, variety of consulting, and so this is a lot of this consulting it uses the different methods that I knew, the bootstrapping, and so on. Um, and then moved on to Google. And some of the things that I've worked on at Google are estimating how effective display ads are, uh, optimizing websites, talk a bit about that, what Chrome apps to show. So uh, uh, you think about your phone and you've got different apps and you're looking for apps. Well, which apps get shown to you as things that you might download? Um, so this was a project where we wanted to show a combination of the older, more popular apps, the ones that have sort of people have shown that they like, as well as some newer apps to give them a chance to bubble up. Mm -hmm. And uh, traffic speeds, uh, detecting changes in query rates, and how to tell if people like Google Maps. And I'll talk about that one in a bit later too. So how does Google make, uh, any questions at this point? Yes, Kirk. I had a question about bootstrapping. Uh, hopefully this makes sense. My understanding is if you have a population, a random population, and you take a sample and you do something to it, but you have to replace it. How careful do you have to be about replacing it to make sure that your population sample is still random? Or is that is that a percentage concern at all? Okay. Uh, do you plan to say anything about bootstrap generally? I'll be talking about bootstrapping, so let's hold that question for later. And once I've done some introduction to bootstrapping, um, feel free to ask it again. Yeah, just holler if it's not clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I, I see someone who's joined this conference. If you were looking for a conference from some other company, uh, somehow they used a conference name that includes my email address, so we've got the duplication. So you might want to check and look for it, um, ask them for a different conference name. 
Okay, um, how Google makes money. You do a search for something like flights to Hawaii and we show ads. Or maybe not. This is the kind of search I usually do. Things like latent variables and look at all those ads. <laughs> so at Google, if you're not doing a search where you want to see ads, we don't want to show ads. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we might make a little more money in the short run, but in the, it doesn't make you happy. And you learn to ignore the ads. We call it ads blindness. So in the long run, we're better off and you're better off if we don't show ads when you don't want to see ads. Yeah. So most of the time, I do not see ads. Except a few years ago, when I was looking for a new car and doing a lot of searches related to new cars, all of a sudden I was seeing a lot more ads than I was ever used to seeing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see the ads. So that's the what we look for. Uh, show ads when you want to see them and otherwise not. So back to this page. This page is important to Google. The search page, the search results. We want to do everything about this page as well as we can. And so we do experiments. We try stuff out. We do experiments on getting better search results, more relevant search results, experiments on getting better ad results, more relevant ad results, experiments with how many ads to show, with how relevant an ad has to be before we show it, experiments with the layout of the page, uh, images, font size, color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you come to Google and do a search, you will be in the active arm of maybe a dozen experiments there are a hundred times that many experiments going on, so you're in the control arm of all of those. We're doing experiments all the time and uh, looking for improvements, sometimes big improvements, sometimes small improvements. And uh, one guy that I sit with was one of the early statisticians at Google and was involved in setting up our experimental infrastructure. And I would know how things were going by how much swearing I would hear over my shoulder. <laughs> uh, you may remember back when you had to type out your full search string and hit return. Mm -hmm. Well, when we started playing around with Google Instant, where we're giving results as, as you're typing, giving suggestions and giving results, I heard a lot of swearing. <laughs> things were just not working. Uh, it, 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 not that it wasn't working well for people, but it wasn't working well for us. We weren't getting the data that we needed to know how things were working. It was a completely different infrastructure. It used to be that the unit of observation was the full search string. And now it's every character that you would type or delete or how long you pause between typing characters and so on. Okay. So we're running all these experiments and looking for improvements. And you might think that because we're at Google and we've got a lot of data, that things like statistical significance, hypothesis tests, randomness wouldn't matter. But that's not true. Often we're looking for small improvements. If we can make an improvement of one tenth of one percent, in the fraction of people that are happy with that first search result, that's a big deal. Hmm. Now, small changes like that are hard to detect. It's hard to distinguish that from random noise. But if we can make that improvement, when you consider the number of people that's affecting, that's a big deal. It's harder to detect, be sure that it's not noise, a million dollar improvement in data our size than in much smaller data. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So this stuff should sound familiar to some extent from the speaker we had from Facebook who told us about how they run experiments. Remember, they were talking about Facebook Live and how should we advertise it? Should we use this wording or should we use that wording? Um, so you can imagine, just like we talked then, doing experiments. Let's give a random collection of our customers this ad and let's give another random selection that ad and compare the difference. And yeah. Any questions? Okay. All right, we're good. Okay. 
All right. So uh, just to note that yeah, uh, data mining is hot and it's important, but experimentation also matters. And we would love to hire more people who know about running experiments. Mm -hmm. experiments. What kinds of uh, what kind of experiments do you do generally? Are these uh, simple, randomized uh, comparative trials, or are they uh, more sophisticated factor fractional factorial designs and things like that? Um, but most of them are fairly simple. Some of them are more complicated. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about something that involves some fraction, some factorial designs. Um, but most of what we do, what we do in my main project, involves fairly simple experiments. Yeah. Uh, in my project, it's A-B experiments, where we have the treatment and the control. Okay. Uh, when we talk about the ads on um, Google, uh, we typically have a layer where there are 50% of the people in the control group and then 50 experiments each with 1% of traffic. Hmm. And then we'll have different layers, um, it, orthogonal, um, running independently of each other so that we run all of the different experiments in different layers. Yeah, okay. Now, you can run your own experiments using Google Analytics content experiments, and this got me to Google. So this is landing page optimization, and this sounds like what Facebook did, where you have a website and you want people to do something, which might be buy something, download some software, make a donation. And you create multiple versions of your web page you add some JavaScript from Google to the main page, the one that people come to, and this JavaScript randomly leaves them there or sends them to one of your other versions and then records if they do what you want. And at Google, we dog food things. We eat our own dog food. We try stuff out. We test things, pre-beta testing. I get to do a lot of this, and I get to... Uh, use a lot of things that really aren't ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we try and work out the bugs before we sh ship them for to everybody else. So in this particular case, we're trying this with Picasa and playing around with four different aspects of the page with what text gets shown here, the text here, the action button, the screenshot, so this is a four-factor experiment, um, each with two levels, so 16 possibilities. Let me just say something briefly about that. Several of us, several of us have not had uh, much of any experimental design. So he said this is a four-factor experiment. What that means is there are four things that they can change the values of. Should we use this version of the top left text box or that one? And, and so on. And you said each of them are two levels, right? In this case, yeah. Okay, so he has four variables that they want to try two values each for and do experiments. Okay. Okay. And so um, ultimately it came down to comparing these two and take a look at those. And which do you think would be more effective? Um, Picasso with image editing software. And the goal here is to get people to download this software and use it for their photos. Uh, how many people think the one on the left is better? And how many people the one on the right? OK, raise your hands for left. And, OK, looks like the majority left, but not a, not a entirely left. So yeah, okay. we vote left. Turns out the one on the right increased downloads by 30%. Huh. So. Who'd have thunk that? Yeah, that's the so value that's of experiments, yeah. No. I guess free download, ooh, that must sound suspicious. Whereas try Picasso now, oh, that's straightforward. Uh, screenshot. This is image editing software. You have to have a screenshot, right? Apparently not. Interesting. So statistical issues here are, well, for the simplest experiments, you would have just two alternatives, two arms. We call that A-B testing. 
Um, in this case, we have multiplies for different factor experiments. And so you're testing a bunch of things. And another issue here is that the data is coming in over time. And we want answers as quickly as possible, but we have to be a little careful about how we do that. There are what we call multiple testing issues here, uh, where if you're not careful, you can make errors far more often than you think you're making errors. So little background. A lot of the experimental designs in statistics were designed by Sir Ronald Fisher and colleagues back at Rothamsted Agricultural Research Station. And the way things worked then was you had to plan things in advance, plan what you were planting in which plots of ground, what fertilizers you were going to apply. And then you let things grow, you harvested, you measured the yields and did the analysis. So very much plan in advance. Mm -hmm. For clinical trials, it used to be that way too. That was how the FDA mandated things. They mandated that you would give them the full experimental plan, how many subjects you would enroll, when you would terminate the trial, what analysis you would do at that point. But they're moving away from that. And then finally, on the web, we can do things continuously where we can analyze results after every new person comes in. So I'll talk about both of these latter two things. So when I was at Insightful, the statistical software company, worked on S plus seq trials, sequential designs for clinical trials. So if you were running the old style clinical trial, you might plan that you would enroll 6,000 subjects, maybe it'd take you two years, and at the end, you would compare the difference in survival probabilities between the two arms, the treatment and the control, and if the difference in survival probabilities was this high or higher, you would declare success. You would have a significant positive result and you could send your new drug to the market. And if he fell short of that point, it's failure and you give up. And the first trial that didn't follow this fixed sample design was the trial for AZT, an HIV drug. Now they planned that they were going to enroll a fixed number of subjects, but as they were going through, they saw that AZT was actually saving lives. And at that point, HIV AIDS was killing people and there was no effective treatment. This looked like it could save lives, so they actually stopped the trial early. Well, now the FDA mandates that you actually analyze the results as you're going along and plan in advance how you might stop the trial early. And do it using software like we did where you might plan that after 1,800 subjects, you analyze the results, and if the difference in survival probabilities is this good or better, then you stop and declare success. And if it's this poor or worse, you give up and stop killing people. And if you're in between, then you continue on, collect more observations, analyze again, and if you are good or bad, you stop and otherwise continue on to the third look and the final look. Yeah. And to do this, it may be that in order to have the same errors, same probability of declaring success when it's really no better, and uh, that's the type one error, or type two error, which is it really is better, but you don't recognize that, you may need to have more subjects than with the fixed sample trial, like around 7,000 in this case. So it could end up costing you more. But on the other hand, you've got a chance of stopping early. Mm -hmm. So how does that balance out? Do you actually save money with this fixed sample, uh, with the sequential approach? And this figure shows the average number of subjects as a function of the true difference in survival probabilities. So if 
your new treatment is actually really good, then what's likely to happen is you'll tend to hit one of those early upper boundaries and stop early and stop after a relatively small number of subjects. Or if it's really bad, you'll hit a lower boundary early. And even if you're in the middle, it turns out that on average, you stop with fewer subjects than the fixed sample trial. So on average, it saves you money. And you're getting the good treatments to market quicker and you're stopping the bad treatments quicker to stop killing people. Mm-hmm. So there are um, good ethical reasons to do this. Any questions? Questions about that? You understand what he's talking about? Clinical trials? Let's study the efficacy of a, of a drug that's being pr- promoted to, to go on the market and treat um, HIV, say, and these sequential trials allow you to design the experiment in such a way that, that there are um, statistical hypothesis testing mechanisms throughout that would allow you to stop early if the evidence is strong enough for you to stop early, which makes sense. If it's costing a lot of money to do the cl- clinical trial, and after a third of the anticipated duration, it's statistically significantly clear that there is a difference, might as well stop and save, save the rest of the money. Or if it's going in the other direction where it's really obvious that there's a detrimental effect of the drug, you should stop and not keep exposing people to it. Okay, All right. I don't see any questions, so we're good, I think. Okay. And uh, I did some consulting at Google. One thing that I do at Google is a lot of miscellaneous consulting for different groups. So this was for the Google Maps. Now, Google Maps in the U.S. are pretty good, right? Mm-hmm. Humor me on that. <laughs> uh, not so good in India and Indonesia, for example. But we're trying to improve. Always looking for new sources of data. Now, when we get a new batch of data... The question is, is this data good enough that it's actually going to improve Google Maps? So what they were doing was randomly picking 500 items out of this new batch of data. Could be addresses of houses, etc. And checking them using humans, which can involve going out and actually checking them in the field. That's expensive. And so I suggested using a sequential approach where you start with a smaller number and if the results are really crappy, just give up on that batch. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, check some more. Uh, if at some point you reach results that are really good, then you stop, uh, et cetera. So on average, you can save money. Yeah. That's cool. And then finally, on the web, on things like the web optimization, we can do multi-arm bandits. Uh, who knows what a one-arm bandit is? Anybody know what the one-arm bandit is? Slot machine? Okay, that's our vote, slot machine. One-arm bandit is a slot machine. You stick in your money, you pull the arm, and it takes your money. <laughs> multi-arm bandit is where you have different slot machines that you can play, and you want to play the one that's best. Or different treatments and you want to use the treatment that's best, or different versions of the website, and you want to use the one that's best. Now, as you're going along, as you're collecting data, as you're running this trial, at any point in time, you have a trade-off. You can do what appears to be best at this point. The treatment that so far has been best, the website that so far has been best, the Um, slot machine that's been giving the best payoff. Or you can continue collecting data from more of the arms because this one appeared to be best, but maybe some other one is actually better. So there's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. And what we're doing is basically, at any point in time, estimating the probability for each one that we think it is the best 
and say that we think ARM1 has a 90% chance of being the best ARM out of all of them, then we'll give it 90% of the traffic. But there's still some doubt. There's still 10% chance that some other ARM is best. So we'll give each ARM traffic in proportion to the doubt. And here's how that might work in practice, where uh, over on the right are the true success probabilities for 10 different options. And we wouldn't know these probabilities in practice. So as we start off, we'll send equal amounts of traffic to each of the 10 different versions of the website. And fairly quickly, we'll figure out that ARM2 is crappy and ARM5 is not so good either and so on. Pretty quickly, we'll weed out the ones that are really bad and send more and more traffic to the ARMs that are best. And over time, the one that is the single best one will get more and more of the traffic. So we see fairly early on, the red, cyan, and purple are getting most of the traffic. And ultimately, ARM1 wins out. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Any questions? Emma. What if your initial users on your websites don't end up being the sort of people who eventually come to it later? What Good question. So what if, what if the initial users on your website are not are not the same people who are going to use it eventually, so that it's not representative somehow. Um, so, if uh, if you were doing your trial and you started at nine at night, you got people who were on the website from nine until three in the morning, and you made your decisions based on that. That may not be representative of what happens during the early morning hours of the day. Uh, just as one example, um, so. But that is kind of a practical issue that you don't want to make your decisions too quickly. You want to get users from different days of the week, different hours of the day. Um, or if your website is really oriented to people who tend to visit at certain hours, you want to do your testing during those hours. Beyond that, there's the issue of people's preferences will change over time, over the course of months and years, etc. And so you may want to continue doing testing every now and then to see if what appeared best at one point in time is still best. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, to calculate the probabilities that one arm is best, we'll actually use a simulation method. If we only had two arms, then we could um, calculate the probabilities mathematically pretty easily. Uh, but with 10 arms, uh, doing the calculations in 10 dimensions gets pretty difficult. So we just basically throw darts and see what fraction of the darts each arm gets. And in this case, we've got 50 trials for arm one, of which 20 were successful. So on average, we think the probability is 0.4, and there's some uncertainty about that. And ARM2 had two trials and three successes. Oh, that's great. It's 67%, but that's not much data. There's a lot of uncertainty. So there's a lot of vertical scatter in the darts. And then by the time you've collected more data from ARM2, that vertical scatter decreases. And at this point, we're pretty sure that ARM2 is better than ARM1. But there's still some uncertainty. These are simulation <coughs> simulation results. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned simulations a couple of times now. So just for the students, simulation would mean um, go to your computer and, and randomly generate data that you think is, is similar to the data that, that you're observing in real life. Randomly generate data sets like you're going to observe and then try methods on them. And then after many replications of that, you can ask, what, what are the operating characteristics of this method that I'm doing? Um, so I wanted to ask you, Dr. Hesterberg, uh, when you're doing simulations like this one, say, um, how, did you, how do you decide the parameters to use in the simulation? Um, you generate some numbers from probability distributions, which distributions do you choose, and what are the parameters of those, and how, how do you defend that? I could imagine uh, presenting, here's my recommendation for what to do 
uh, in this experiment, how did you come up with that? Well, I did a simulation. Well, how do you know the simulation is anywhere close to the real world? Um, so question about, like, how do you at Google go about constructing a, a simulation that you're confident is representative of what you want it to be and is defensible uh, to others? Uh, okay. Um, uh, so this is a Bayesian approach, and I don't know if you've talked about that, but okay. there's sort of two broad approaches in statistics. A frequentist approach that just has sort of says, let the data show us. An Bayesian approach that allows us to use some prior information that we have. So if we have done previous studies and we were pretty confident that arm one was better than the others, we might reflect that in the distributions that we're using for the simulations. Mm. Well, so at least that's the theory. There's the frequentist approach that doesn't take prior information or belief into account and the Bayesian approach that does. Well, except it's a little more complicated than that. The Bayesian approach doesn't have to really use prior information, prior beliefs. There are Bayesian approaches that essentially just let the data show you. And that's an approach that we're using here. So we're not imposing our prior beliefs. We're letting the data show us. If we have 20 successes in 40 trials, the simulations that we use have a probability 0.4 of succeeding and an amount of uncertainty that corresponds to 50 trials. So we're really not doing anything where uh, we would have to defend it. We're basically letting the data show us. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay, moving on to resampling. Bootstrap methods and related methods. Uh, we use them at Google. And one of my side things, I was an educator and I still care about statistics education. I'm pushing for more use of these resampling methods in statistics because I think students will learn statistics better using the simulation based methods rather than just formulas. And pushing for their use more in statistical practice because they're more accurate than formula methods in many cases and they let us do better statistics. Um, comment on that. If you've had an introductory statistics course where you may have learned early in the course about means and medians, and the medians have the advantage of being less sensitive to outliers, so they're more robust, less likely to give just wild results that don't make sense. But then later in the course, when it's time to do confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, you try to forget that you ever heard about that median and just work with means, <laughs> because there are nice simple formulas for that. Well, when we're using the resampling methods and we're not tied to those formulas, we can go ahead and use more robust things like medians or robust regression for looking at relationships. We can do better statistics. So when you guys so, learned, sorry, when you guys learned about p-values and confidence intervals um, in STAT 211, it, it was just as he described, typically. Um, let's do inference on a mean. To do a test with a mean, you do a t-test. To do a confidence interval for a mean, you do a t-based confidence interval. That's what you could call formula-based inference. Um, in theory, the sampling distribution of the sample mean should be approximately normal and things like that. The bootstrap is a is a alternative, and one nice thing about the bootstrap is that it makes it really easy to do inference on whatever statistic or parameter you want. You're not restricted to means. You could easily do medians. You could do ratios of of, of things. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, thinking back to the Google search results, uh, the the Google search page. One thing about Google is the data that we have is not like the data that you may be used to working with, where everything sits on one single machine. For us, you do one search, and your result may go on to server one. 
And later you do another search and that result goes on the server 3030. The results are stored across millions of servers. And this affects the kind of statistics we can do. Things like means are easy to compute because we just add up across all the servers and then add those. We add within a single server, add those sums across combinations of servers, add those up and finally get the overall results. We compute the mean by the sum divided by the number of observations. Medians on the other hand are hard to compute. Well, so it's easy for us to compute things like means, but not necessarily easy for us to compute formula confidence intervals. And the reason for that is, um, uh, imagine that we are thinking of something which is the average amount that we're paid for searches to Hawaii. So computing that is pretty easy. We just add up the sum, how much was paid for searches, clicks on searches to Hawaii, divided by the number. But when we want to measure the variability of that number, we can't use the standard formulas because here, what we want to think of as random is not the individual search, but the user. Some people don't do any searches for flights to Hawaii. Some do a bunch of them. And so to use the right formulas, what we would have to do would be to have the data for each individual person together. So we would count up how much was paid for that per searches by that person divided by how many searches they did. Mm -hmm. And because of the way the data is stored, we can't do that. So instead we use a bootstrapping approach and I'm going to skip over the details of this and show you a uh, other bootstrapping example in a bit. So we actually do bootstrapping because it's computationally easier. We don't have to collect each individual's observation together. Okay. So I want to change statistical education replace the formulas with the computer simulation methods yeah. because it's easier to understand, more accurate, and we're not limited to simple statistics. Yeah. And I'll use this example um, to demonstrate. Uh, this was from some consulting that I did while at Verizon. Verizon was the telephone, um, this was back when people had landlines. How many of you have landlines? <laughs> Actually, five or six of them. Okay. So, in any given area, there is one company that provides the landline service and they provide the local service. But you can get your long distance service from a variety of companies. And if something goes wrong, that local incumbent local exchange carrier, the ILAC, is supposed to make repairs. And they're supposed to do it as quickly for their own customers, uh, for other companies' customers, as for their own customers. And this is regulated by the Public Utilities Commissions. And in this particular case, for one class of service, one time period, one competitor, there were 1,600 repairs that Verizon made for their own customers with an average repair time of eight hours. 23 repairs made for another company's customers with an average of 16 hours. So that looks like Verizon is discriminating. But maybe it's just random. The data are here. We have a lot of short repairs and then a few long ones for the other company's customers. A lot of short repairs and one long one. Well, there's one outlier there. Maybe that difference is largely due to that one outlier. Here's another view of the data where the actual repair times are on the vertical axis and then we just see each point. And uh, this is called the normal probability plot, which you can use to decide whether the data look normal. If they looked normal, 
things would fall in a straight line here. Mm -hmm. These are definitely not straight lines. The data are definitely not normal. Um, what we see is that the repairs tend to be longer, even aside from that outlier, for the blue points than for the orange. So maybe there's something going on there that's not just the one outlier. So in bootstrapping, what we basically do is if I have a sample size 1600, I take my data and I draw a sample size 1600 with replacement from that data. And then I calculate the sample mean or whatever I was working with for this resample. I've got the sample mean for the original data, and then I've got a sample mean for the resample. And I repeat that a thousand times. So I get 10,000 sample means. And these guys, here's a histogram of them. They show me how much the sample mean varies just due to random sampling for data like this with a sample this size, 1,600. And so the original mean was 8.4. The average of these guys is 8.4. We see the amount of variability. Uh, we see that the distribution looks pretty normal. And in contrast for the smaller data set, we see a lot more variability in the sample mean due to random sampling. So the question is, why is there so much more variability? Here, we only went from 7.5 to 9.5, a range of 2. Here, we're going from 10 to 30. Why is there so much more variability here? So much more uncertainty. Are you asking? I'm asking. OK. Uh, let me back up and say something real quick. Um, when you take a sample and you compute something on the basis of the sample, like a sample average, that's an estimate of the population average. But it's just an estimate. And it's subject to random variability because the data you based it on is randomly uh, obtained. So when we do inference, we have to work with what we call the sampling distributions of our statistic. I saw this estimate, but I know that if I were to repeat this and go get a new sample in the same way and do the same stuff, I'd see a slightly different number. So these histograms that he's showing are essentially estimates of sampling distributions of these these means that we're trying to compute. And what we just saw is that the, was it ILEC? Yeah. Uh, ILEC distribution of sample means, according to the bootstrap, is substantially less variable than for the other one. So we see greater variation. If you were to repeat the study and compute a mean again, the CLEC means will be varying more from sample to sample than the ILEC. So why, he asked, um, why do you think that is, Taylor? Is it because you're uh, resampling and in your bootstrap, you're resampling the same sample, so it's essentially going to be, uh, you're more likely to get, uh, you're not going to have all these uh, new data points? So. Uh, Essentially, due to the resampling process, we're just sampling from the same data set, so the same kind of, uh, I guess, additional variability that was in the CLEC measures will show up here. Anybody um, else have a, have a thought? Yeah, uh, so that's actually part of it. I've got we, one more one more thought here, and let me okay. uh, uh, let's see how this one goes. T Tessa, go ahead. question was, isn't the sample size smaller with the blue group? Much that, smaller. Much smaller. OK, so what does that make you think? Suppose that it is smaller. Does that have any relevance to this? And if so, why? Go ahead, Tessa. Why? Um, so smaller sample size is going to give you more variability because an outlier is going to have a higher effect on a smaller sample size than it would on a larger sample size. Yeah. And um, well, these are significantly different. One's in the thousands and one's right. 23. Yeah. 
Anybody remember what the, the variance of a sample mean is? Suppose you take a sample from a population that has a mean mu and a variance sigma squared. Yes, uh, the standard deviation would be that population standard deviation sigma divided by the square root of n. That's the variance of a sample mean. So if the sample size is smaller, that variance is going to tend to get bigger. So that's one argument. Okay, that's our submission, Dr. Hesterberg. Yeah, so the two factors are the big one is the smaller sample size. When you've got less data, you're just less certain about the mean. Random variation has a bigger effect. And then also the, this data that we were sampling from is a little more spread out than this data. So in terms of the classical formulas, the sample standard deviation, the numerator there, is a little bit bigger for this sample. But by far the biggest effect is the sample size. Okay, um, and I'm going to skip this. We've got, um, about, we've got about eight minutes left of, of class time, just FYI. Not a lot of time, okay. So one thing that we could do is we could consider using trimmed means instead of ordinary means. A trim mean is, say you have a set of data, you might do a 25% trim mean where you sort the data and ignore 25% on each side and take the mean of the middle 50%. So this is kind of like a median. The median ignores 50% of the data on each side and takes the mean of the middle one or two observations. It's kind of a compromise between a mean and a median. In this case, we see that if we were to use trend means instead of ordinary means, we would get quite a bit less variability the standard error, the standard deviation of these distributions would be 2.7 instead of 4. So from a statistical point of view, we'd prefer this more robust statistic, this trim mean, this, that's not so sensitive to outliers. Uh, in practice here, though, this is a highly regulated thing, and anything that hints of throwing away data is verboten. We don't do that. So we stick with the ordinary mean. Okay, I'm going to just mention that if you use classical t-tests here for testing whether there is in fact a difference between the two groups, the t-test would say the p-value is one half of one percent. But the more accurate simulation method that gives the right answer, and this is recognized back by Sir Ronald Fisher, um, would give 1.8%. And here, uh, in this regulated situation, the critical value is 1%. So the correct answer is that difference is not statistically significant at the 1% level. If you use the formula method, you would say it is. The formula method is off by a factor of four. It's just way off. Okay, I'm gonna now skip ahead to the very end. Um, at Google, we've got statisticians in a lot of different teams, a lot of different projects, a lot of locations. And it's not just Google. There's a lot of jobs and statistics everywhere. Uh, skills, you, you need to understand stats. You need to be able to consult with people, uh, help understand what their problem is. Often, talking through the problem helps them understand better what's going on. You need to be able to do programming. Uh, experimental design, we'd love to have more people with knowledge of that. And writing is important and giving presentations is important. Any, any preferences on programming um, languages or specific types of uh, skills there? Um, we use a lot of R. We don't use SAS. Um, there's a lot of Python at Google. Uh, there's a lot of C, um, the software engineers are going to use a lot of C++ and Java and Python. Statisticians, a lot of R and Python. Mm -hmm. Other languages are used. Uh, we use a lot of um, a variation of SQL. Okay. Uh, but 
the specific language isn't as important as the fact that you've used at least a couple of languages and can pick up new languages. Yeah. Uh, so for career prep, technical prep matters, uh, communication matters, and uh, I look for adaptability. So a positive thing is studying abroad. Studying abroad is hard, but in doing so, you learn to adapt to different situations. And having done that, you can tackle things when you come back. Choose interesting work for your job, not just what makes the most money. Live frugally, and this means the big things are, are house and car. So don't buy that big house in the suburb and the big fancy car. Live cheaper, and this gives you a lot more flexibility in job choice, and if you need to leave a job, it's a lot easier to do so. You reduce your stress, and it's very good if you can avoid driving. Uh, you're going to be busy when you leave college. If you think you're busy now, you'll be busier later. And getting exercise can be hard. Well, if you get your exercise while you're commuting, then you get your exercise. Whereas if you drive and have to make extra time for exercise, that you may never do it. Yeah. Keep fit. Um, bike or walk to work and eat right. I'm, I'm pretty old. And I have observed over time how the portions in restaurants have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is not healthy. You don't need to eat that much food. And get involved in stuff, in professional groups, give talks, organize sessions, uh, raise your profile. Um, volunteer for community groups. One strength historically in this country was women didn't work but we had a lot of really talented women who wanted to do something and so they volunteered for community groups and they really drove a lot of community groups. And now community groups don't have that easy source of talent and community groups need volunteers. Uh, get involved and you'll meet, meet people doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Are there any last questions? All right. Any qu uh, go ahead, Megan. Uh, yeah, so do you have any recommendations or tips for um, internships and related entry points into places like Google and, and other tech related, related tech companies? What would you recommend? And, uh, so internships are a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, you'll want to apply early. Uh, January roughly is when you should be looking to apply for internships. Um, at Google, I think there's a deadline of January 24th. If you try and apply after that, it's too late. The American Statistical Association every year will have a listing of internships from a lot of different companies and just look through that list. Um, and so internships are good in a couple of ways. You get to see what the workplace is like. You get to see whether that is a place that you would like to work. The people there get to see how you work and whether you would fit in there, whether this would be a good place for, whether they're interested in having you work there. Mm -hmm. um, so for Google, it's a good way to get into Google. Getting hired at Google is hard. The, the chances of getting hired are small, but with an internship, you've got a better chance. So do try for the internships. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of what we look for when we're hiring Google, we have four main criteria statistical uh, for statisticians. Statistical knowledge, data intuition. Can you work with data and get something out of it? And for this, doing some consulting is good experience. Computing and communication. OK, thank you. Uh, any other last minute questions? We're out of time, so we need to let him go. Yeah. OK, well, let's thank our guest. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for arranging.